good conference when they have food like that out there. So round of applause for our organizers. <clears throat> Of course, I say that like right after one of them walks out the room. So good timing on my part. Um, so today, we're going to talk about the importance of developer communities, um, why they matter, and then more importantly, for, for your takeaway, is how to build them. Uh, so a little background on me. Um, my name is Jennifer Wadella. I am a self-taught front-end developer. Um, I do a lot of work with, with girls in STEM. You might have heard that buzzword around science, technology, engineering, math, the lack of women in those fields, blah, 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 blah. blah. We've heard that story. Um, I'm also the founder of Kansas City Women in Technology. Again, same in that story, but it's, it's a community, hey, that ties into what we're talking about today. Um, I also run Coder Dojo, Kansas City. Um, really cool global nonprofit. I'll talk about it a little more later. It was founded over in Ireland, and we teach kids how to program, because if you haven't noticed, you're getting hit up by recruiters every day all the time, being like, come work for us. We have the best job ever for you. Uh, everybody says that. So we, we need more programmers, and, and this is a step in the right direction. So why are developer communities important? And um, just a heads up, I know this is a JavaScript conference, so I can use the word developer, but I might say programmer, I might say engineer. Different, but in this talk, they, they mean the same thing. Um, so let's talk about specifically why they are important and, and why they're such this driving force. Uh, the first thing is culture. <laughs> I, I'm willing to bet a lot of you were uh, this kid in school if, if you're a developer now, um, you know, trying to be inherently lazy and find ways uh, to make the computer work for you. Um, so there are, there are a lot of common ties that we have based on our skill set and what we do that tie each, uh, tie each other together and, and create this kind of culture. Um, we hear about Google and Facebook a lot as regards to kind of the pinnacle for developers to work at. And, and it might be their product, but it might actually be the fact that they have a developer culture and engineering culture and, and something they, they clearly think about and, and draw some of the best talent because of that. Um, so we can take away a lot of key things from that. Just because they're in the Silicon Valley doesn't mean they, they kind of have the monopoly on this. We can create the kind of culture and the kind of environment that we want as developers, as programmers, as engineers, and we can do it right from the Midwest, because let's face it, life here is pretty freaking awesome. Um, so I want to talk about what the kind of culture you're looking for. Um, when I do work with kids, uh, I used to work at a marketing agency, and, and I'd bring them on tours, and, and they'd sh see people shooting like Nerf guns around and going all sorts of crazy. So that, that's culture to little kids. And, and you know that's the kind of cool nerdy stuff that we think is awesome and that you see in the uh, Silicon Valley show. But um, this is more real culture. Once, once you grow up as a developer, are you interested in a company that is growth oriented? Do you want to be using? new technology? Um, are you wanting to jump on the Angular bandwagon, or are you still rocking like MVC2 and .NET? Um, do you want to be working on innovative projects? Do you want to have time for open source work? Do you want to have time for research and development to actually build tools to help you do your job better? Are you interested in full stack development? Is DevOps your thing? These are all terms that we're seeing and hearing, and, and just because you're a developer doesn't mean you can help these changes come up the totem pole to create the kind of company you want to work at. Um, a lot of times when you're talking to management, um, and depending on the size of your company, if you come to them with an idea and can present a good case for it, they're going to be like, well, I don't, I don't know enough about it, but you've clearly done your homework, so hell yeah, let's do it. Um, so culture leads into community, um, and I kind of want to go back to psychology. Has anybody taken a psych course? OK, so we got a couple hands in the room. I'm going to give you guys a crash course. So there's this dude, Maslow, right? Um, in 1943, he stated that people are motivated um, to achieve a certain set of needs. Um, and so he came up with this pyramid structure. At the base level, we've got physiological, health, food, sleep, the very basic things we need to survive. And so he stated that once we fulfill these needs, we move up to the next level, which is safety. So shelter, removal from danger, all those guns you're stockpiling in your basement for the zombie apocalypse, that, that's all at this level of the triangle. So once we've satisfied that, we move up to a, wanting to achieve belonging. And here's where community ties in. Here's why you have that, that innate urge to find people that are like you, who will accept you and be driven in similar ways. It's because we as humans seek belonging, love, affection, being a part of a group. Um, so how many people in the room are um, happy with where their skill set is now? 
No hands? Okay, well, you might, you might not want to spend a lot of time at conferences if you're not looking to get better. Um, might be a waste of your money. Um, but everybody else in the room, yes, wants, wants to approve, wants to achieve things. So that takes us up to the next level, which is esteem from ourselves and from others. Uh, one of my first jobs out of college, it was uh, kind of an email marketing company, and I was the only in-house designer and developer. And everybody loved me. I, I met deadlines on time. The clients loved my work. But as far as the client managers were concerned, I graduated from Hogwarts School of Coding because they had no idea what I did. And so when I would conquer something, when I would achieve something, I, I had a scene for myself, but not from others because they had no idea what I was actually doing. And so when you find a community that, that shares the same ideals, you can achieve this level and get so much more satisfaction from it because you're surrounded by others who get what you accomplish. And uh, the very top level, self-actualization, um, depending on how existential we want to get. Um, this is achieving your individual potential, growing in the ways you want to grow. And um, this is another thing that, that you get from communities. Uh, if you live in this, in this little fishbowl, in this little silo, how are you going to know what there is out there to achieve unless you're surrounding yourself with people who are doing things and pushing boundaries and, and making things better to have something to aspire to. If you can do that in a glass bowl, you're kind of a badass, but I personally cannot do that. So, um, so we talked about growth. Uh, there are so many catchphrases that talk about this. Surround yourself with, with um, people who are amazing. Birds of a feather flock together. You're the culmination of like your five closest friends. This is all very true. You're going to mimic most closely those people you surround yourself with. So being in a community really gives you that opportunity for growth and to achieve success. Um, knowledge sharing. Another key takeaway we get from communities. Um, no man or woman is an island. Um, does anybody know why I have a rubber duck here? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's, there's this concept in programming, I'm sure you're familiar with it, where if you're struggling with a problem, you explain it out loud to some sort of inanimate object, a rubber duck. And, and a lot of the times, in the middle of explaining, you're going to be like, oh, duh. But it can be just as satisfying to tell it to an actual person. A coworker, a friend, talking out loud that the pro problem can really help you. And it's this kind of collaboration, this togetherness, that can help us achieve better solutions than, than we might have achieved on our own. Um, collaboration, GitHub. Talk about a great place of, of bringing like minds, like communities together to create absolutely amazing work. Um, we have online forums for ourselves. Um, a while ago, developers had this reputation of um, being mushrooms. Uh, they like to be alone in a dark room to just do their own thing. They didn't, they didn't really like to interact. Um, we, there might still be a few of these um, fungi running around, but for the most part, we were in a conference, right? We're, begrudgingly sometimes talking to people, but we like interacting. The cool thing about GitHub is you can interact with other developers and you don't even have to do it in person. You can do it from your computer. Sweet online community. <laughs> All right, um, so let's look at some other examples. Um, we have defined community as a social, religious, occupational, or other group sharing common characteristics and interest in perceived or perceiving itself as a distinct and some respect from the larger society within which it exists. We have a pretty unique skill set here. So that is often, often a big separating factor for us. Um, we have shared interests. Um, a lot of you laughed at that comic. How many people read XKCD in the room? OK, OK, shared interests. Um, all sorts of communities. Um, so we're first going to look at examples inside of the workplace, because um, you probably spend 40 hours a week there. And by 40, I mean 60 or 70 or 80, uh, probably more time than you might spend with your family. So let's take a look there. Teams. <clears throat> if you work at a larger company, you're probably factioned into teams revolving around, maybe it's a particular client, maybe it's a particular product. Um, I spent a long time in a marketing agency. It was all about the client. Um, so teams are probably the the most unique form of a community that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's something you were probably put onto, unless you had the fortune of being able to pick and choose what team you're on. Um, but like this image shows, you probably go through war together. And you come out stronger on the other side. And that goes and, and builds a sense of community. So that's a really powerful one inside the workplace. Um, 
when I was at that marketing agency, we were very siloed um, into different disciplines. And so within a team, you might have like a JavaScript dev and, and a Java dev. And a, well, we didn't talk to the Drupal devs because they did their own thing and didn't like to talk to any of the rest of us. And nobody messed with the sysadmins. So uh, that brings us to our next type of community disciplines. Because I dissed on the sysadmins. Waits for more laughs. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Um, oh, did it just take that long to read? My bad. Okay, so um, disciplines kind of have their their own community, their own culture within each other. Um, a lot of JavaScript kids running around here, so a lot of times we're on the same page together and don't get over fights um, over anything other than like you know whatever MVC framework you're using. Although Angular seems to be winning. <clears throat> Um, but disciplines are uh, another very important community inside the workplace because those are going to be the people who, who share the skill sets that are, that are most uh, close with yours. They're going to have similar problems to solve that you do. They're going to have similar insights. Um, and maybe they're just going to completely jump ship because they see the new shiny language and they're just a bandwagon hopper. Um, workplace user groups. Um, we have a, a large healthcare company, I'm, I'm from Kansas City, I forgot to mention that, um, called Cerner, and they are probably one of our, our top tech hires. Um, but they do this extraordinarily well. They do user groups inside their own company so well that they sometimes don't even go to the outside user groups. Um, and so they have all sorts of people running different meetups, um, except instead of meetup.com, they've, they've got their intranet site, they've got this whole section segmented out for developers. But really cool example of community because again, such a large company, they get really siloed into different teams and a lot of times there won't be communication outside of some sort of workplace user group. Uh, when I was at a marketing agency, we uh, had a group called Afternoon Tea, uh, tea meaning beer because we were in marketing. Um, and I kind of inherited this group uh, when somebody couldn't continue running it. And uh, it had been kind of um, restrained to one team. Uh, I think they were working on Pioneer at the time. And so it was just the Pioneer people. And somehow I got pulled into the mix. Well, I had been on, on the Bayer team. But then I had also worked on Revlon for a while. So I kind of like pulled the Revlon devs in. And, and I pulled the Bayer devs in. And then all of a sudden, they're branching out to different teams as projects start, and then pulling people into this afternoon T user group. And all of a sudden, we have this united front of all the front end developers at this pretty large company that can get very segmented, sharing ideas. Because even though the clients had very unique websites, they didn't necessarily have very unique needs. And so we could come together and cross-pollinate knowledge and figure out, oh, well, we already solved problem A. Why are you banging your head against the wall when here we have the solution? And, and that wouldn't have otherwise been available if, if we didn't have that kind of community going on. Granted, the project manager still managed to find other ways to like muck that, muck that area up. But that's the story of our life, right? Um, so a couple other workplace communities you can implement, thought leadership groups. Um, we have called them centers of excellence in the past, um, which is a different one. And lunch and learns. Lunch and learns are so freaking easy because even if people don't want to hear your talk, they're going to come from the free food and then kind of get forced to hear your talk. So you know, it's a really great idea to like project your ideas into your company um, and get a pretty willing audience, um, especially if you, again, go to a boss, go to a manager, and say, hey, I've got this idea. Uh, I've got it all laid out. You just need to give me like you know 40 bucks for pizza for everybody. They're going to be like, so you're going to get people to stay and work on their lunch break and learn something. There, there's no bad thing here. You know, go ahead and do it. So lunch and learns, fantastic way. Uh, another thing that I will talk about later um, is is speaking. And lunch and learns are such a good way to dip your toe in the water. If you're interested in starting to speak to to get more community involvement, lunch and learns super easy way to practice. Also on kids, which is um, pretty easy, but that, that's later in the presentation, too. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about online forums that are other versions of community. Do you know there's an R programming? That's a pretty active subreddit. A lot of good content in there. Lot, that's a very good community. Um, we mentioned GitHub, GitHub excuse me. <clears throat> uh, we've got Geeklist, Stack Overflow, Twitter. So those are all other communities that you can get involved in. Uh, the cool thing about these is because they're online, you don't even have to put on your pants to do that. Um, so we talked about internal user groups, but there are probably a lot of active meetups. Um, 
I'm a slacker and I didn't Google all the ones here in Oklahoma City, but I'm sure Amanda or Jesse can tell you all about them. Um, but this is just a sampling of what we have going on in Kansas City. So these are all the different communities, all the different meetup groups that you can go and get involved in. Kansas City Geek Night um, has been kind of a, in an interesting place, but the original intent was um, to show up after work with your laptops, you could work on stuff, you could you know, bitch about the stuff you're working on and get super tanked while doing it. So that was the origins of Casey Geek Night. Um, we did it at a, at a wine bar and they would do two for one bottle of wine night and I spent many a hungover Tuesdays uh, thanks to that group. We have WordPress Kansas City. They do WordPress, who knew? Uh, Node Casey um, kind of took all our JavaScript developers uh, when we lost our main JavaScript group. Um, Girl Develop It is actually a global, um, global national, I think just national, that teaches women how to program. We did have a Kansas City chapter launch, Kansas City Code for America Brigade. Um, I don't know if they've done anything half as awesome as Tulsa has done, but hopefully they're on the way. Uh, Lambda Lounge KC, they talk about like super nerdy programming stuff. Uh, Kansas City Women in Technology, hey, that's me. Um, one of the things we do is we actually do pre-meetups for all these groups because uh, you may not realize this, but not a lot of girls show up to the meetup groups. And if you're the only one walking in the room to this like room full of dudes, it's really fucking intimidating. So we try and do pre-meetups where all the women can come and meet each other beforehand and not be the only woman walking in the group. And everybody loves it because the women get to go and the guys are like, yeah, more attendees for our meetup group. And, and we have women, so we can say we're supportive now. Um, We've got Python KC that meets a couple times. Upfront is our front end user group um, that pops up every now and again. Kansas City Drupal user group, Kansas City mobile app developer group. I'm pretty sure I got like five new emails for other random pop ups uh, springing up this week. Um, so, yes, meetup.com. If you haven't used it before, check it out. Great way to get involved in any kind of community you want. Um, so we're going to talk about how to build a community, because um, that's kind of the, the goal of this talk. And we're going to talk about active versus passive ways, because some people are very, yeah, I'm motivated, let's go, let's do this, I'm going to plan a conference. That person is not me, by the way. I'm in awe of, of all they've done. Um, so I wanted to make sure to give you um, what I call passive ways to build a community. And these are things that you can do that you might not even think about that will still help build and, and foster a sense of community with very little effort on your part, hopefully. And sometimes, again, you won't even have to put on pants to do so. <clears throat> so we are defining passive as, as tending to take an active or dominant, not excuse me, um, tending not to take an active or dominant part. Uh, so the first one, um, I'm going to actually have you guys practice. It's called making connections, networking for developers. It's not like networking with normal people because you actually want to hear what they have to say. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm going to have you guys practice this because it's unbelievable how many times we're at a conference like this, see somebody we know, and don't introduce everybody that we're talking to because, you know, Joe over here might be really interested in what Sue has to say, and unless you make that connection for them, you, that's never going to happen. So I'm going to have you guys practice this, okay? If you don't know the person next to you, introduce each other. And then introduce the person on your left to the person on your right. If you don't have a person on either side, you're going to have to kind of move a little bit. All right? Ready? Break. <laughs> I guess I probably should have flagged this session as interactive, huh? I made you get up. God, I'm such a jerk. You didn't have to move. OK. Um, so funny little story. The first time I, I ever talked at a conference, um, they, they had a speaker's room. It's this really like super late lounge you get to go into and feel like you're hot shit. Um, so I walk into this room, fairly intimidated, never having spoken before. And there's this table full of dudes. And they look up at me. 
and then start talking with each other. Nobody even like bothers to say, hi, I'm so-and-so, welcome to the group. And it just like terrified me. And I'm like, oh my God, I shouldn't be here. I'm gonna go hide in a corner. And so it's just one of those little things that you may not even think about that can just have such a positive impact for building the kind of communities that we want, that are inclusive, that people want to be a part of, that, that foster this sense of collaboration. Um, so next very passive way to build community. Lunch it up. <laughs> Get away from your desk. Um, you know, grab a couple people, especially people you don't know, or you know, grab a buddy that works somewhere else and go somewhere. This is um, actually at our, our pigwitch truck. We have a local butchery, and they do the most amazing banh mi sandwich ever. Um, really important note for this, though. Seriously, it's ridiculous. Um, invite the new guy. It's the most simple concept, but uh, when you're that new person in the room, you're not necessarily going to insert yourself into situations. Uh, you're not sure of your surroundings yet. Um, I was on this team, and the guys would go out to lunch all the time, and I was in this big like sack lunch phase, because I'm like, yeah, I'm going to save money. Well, eventually, I just got way too lazy for that, and I started going out to lunch with the guys. And the new kid is sitting on his own. And so like maybe three days into this new activity on my part, I'm like, hey, Tyler, you want to go to lunch? And he's like, oh, OK. Nobody had asked him. They just all got up in a group and left. And here's the new guy in the corner just kind of like doing his own thing. So it was just like the most basic thing. And because I invited him to lunch, he's all of a sudden part of the group. And we're getting his voice and his input and his value added to the community. Very simple thing. Lunch it up, invite the new guy. If you take any way, anything away from the presentation, memorize that. OK, so this next one's pretty easy, too. Um, we talked about communities being inside the workplace. Uh, if you like your job, don't you want more people that you like to work at your job? So if you like it, evangelize it. Let people know that you love your employer, that you love where you work. Because again, I mentioned we, we get hit up by recruiters all the time. And whatever they're saying to me doesn't mean crap. But if somebody tells me about their awesome job, who's a developer, I'm going to listen. I'm going to clue in. And so this is how we can build the kind of companies that we want to be working for, is by making sure that we get the talent and the kind of people we want to work with in the door in the first place. <clears throat> um, oh, I also want to take a uh, minute to talk about social karma. Um, so talking about your employer. Uh, in a positive light makes them look good, but it also makes you look good because you're not, you know, the person working at the job being like, oh, it sucks here, I hate it, blah, 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 blah. And I'm guilty of this. I'm sure we all are in the room. But if you make a conscious effort uh, to think about this, I'm a strong believer in social karma. It will come back to you. Uh, next very passive thing to do, actually go to stuff. <laughs> really simple concept. Um, you're at a conference, so good job. Step one, accomplished. Um, so a lot of employers, we talked about culture earlier, um, are starting to clue into this whole thing and realizing, huh, if I want to attract good talent, I need to provide certain activities for them. Uh, we have another company in Kansas City called Perceptive Software, and they are well known for their dodgeball court indoors. Um, so they've kind of created cool activities, and they're definitely taking note. Um, the marketing agency that I used to work at actually just introduced a speaker series, um, not only for their developers, but they're trying to bring more talent into Kansas City to come speak, to come inspire, to come take us to the next level. And it's really easy. You just have to show up. Who knew? <clears throat> um, this is a big one. Um, again, with the social karma, champion the developers around you. Um, we've all met the egotistical person who's like, ha, 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 I just contributed to this GitHub project, and I'm the shit, and blah, 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 blah. But we also have a lot of people that are going to do really amazing stuff and not brag about it. So when you see somebody do something awesome, brag for them. Make it known that they are a fantastic contribution to the community, because we will all grow together when we do that, when we're supporting each other and, and calling attention to people who deserve recognition. There, there's no bad there. The only thing we're going to do is build each other up, give each other more confidence, and social karma. Um, give feedback. So I talked about championing your employer and preaching about it. Um, but do it the right way. 
um, say something is a, you know, might be problematic and offer a solution versus this sucks because no job is ever going to be perfect. Um, we're never going to be in the perfect situation in the perfect world, but we can take a more positive approach to make the kind of change that we want to see. Oh, crap, side note. Um, back to championing. Um, I did want to hit on this issue a little bit. Um, is everybody familiar with like champion versus mentor? Okay, this is kind of a new conversation, um, especially revolving around uh, women in, in career ladders. Um, so mentoring is uh, when you have a person and they're going to help you achieve something. They're um, going to give you career advice. You can go to them with questions. You can say, hey, I've got this problem. You know, I need help solving it, da 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 da. That's a mentor. A champion is very different. A champion is going to be the one who um, puts your name up for the promotions, um, recommends you for the tough project that needs the best of the best, the person that's going to help you advance in the workplace and get the kind of recognition you deserve. So I just wanted to make sure to touch on those two items because those two are very key for especially women advancing in the workplace. Um, so if you are in that position of power to champion people around you, I would encourage you to always have that in the back of your mind um, to make sure that the right people are getting to where they need to be. Um, this is all about community. We need to support each other. We need to build ourselves up. <coughs> Sorry. Can I mute this real quick? <coughs> I got a cold at like the worst time ever. Thanks, body. Um, so another passive way to build communities, use social media. Um, I'm not kidding. So funny story about why I'm here today. Uh, I don't know, when was this? Like May, early in the spring sometime, this, this website launched. And it was called codebabes.com. And it was teaching coding by women stripping. And I was like, are, are you kidding me? I cannot think of a more backwards idea to support the advancement of women to technology. This is bullshit. And of course, like I take to Twitter and I'm like, right, right, right. this other chick dev from Oklahoma City, and I'm like, hell yeah, Midwest dev chick, you know? Well, it turns out she runs this event, and she wanted me to come speak at it. <laughs> Use Twitter. <laughs> All right, um, so now we're gonna talk about active community building. So this is for a more proactive, like, power, ready to go, ready to kick some butt. I'm so excited after Jennifer's talk, I'm gonna change the world. Um, so I wanna give you a couple hints here. Um, the first thing, I, I couldn't find a better like place for this picture, but it just makes me laugh, so there you go. Just ask. Um, I mentioned this earlier when you're trying to get some sort of programmed off, off the ground. Um, if you do all the heavy lifting, if you say, here's my idea, here's how I'm going to execute it, um, here's the, the positive outcomes from it, here's what I need. If you've done all the heavy lifting, most of the time, all you need to do is ask, and somebody's going to say yes, whether that's management, whether that's some sort of community sponsor. All you have to do is ask. Um, there's just so much, many cool things that happen when you kind of like start down this train. Um, you're going to get more than you think you would get, and other people are going to see that, and, and you're going to kind of start the ball rolling for community building. Um, next one, start a group. Um, pretty basic. You have an interest, let's say it's uh, big data, because like that's the awesome buzz right now. Everybody's like, big data, big data, big data. Um, start a meetup group. There's this really cool website that lets you do it super easily. Okay, <laughs> um, this is actually, I think, in the background, Casey Geek Night. Um, we have a really cool um, bar, I suppose. It's like a really open area, and they have the free Wi-Fi, and they love like the nerd community, so they're always super hospitable to us. And so that's a really good place to go and talk geek and, and host a meetup group. And um, they are to the point that they will have like multiple meetup groups on one night. Um, so really awesome. Okay. So this next one, get excited for, because it's one that you don't have to put on pants for that's still active. Start a chat group. Oh my God, right? Who, who spent their days in IRC? Who's still in IRC? Right? Right? Okay. Um, so starting a chat group can be a really good way to get access to people that you can't always meet face to face. Um, shameless promotion, this is our Midwest dev chat channel where we have all the Midwest developers. Uh, ping me for an invite afterwards if you want in. Um, but a really cool way to get access to people who um, might have knowledge in areas that you don't that you know aren't just like a coffee shop away. 
So really easy. You don't have to put on pants for it. Just start a chat group. You can even do it in Google Hangouts. That's, that's another good one. Um, but in Slack, you can search through history, which is nice. Um, so blogging. <laughs> And this picture is because I hate blogging and I hate writing and I'm terrible, but I'm going to tell you to do it anyway because it's an important way to build community. Um, these next couple, uh, we're going to talk about how to establish yourself as kind of a thought leader. Um, you all have something to offer, something to bring to the conversation. Um, and blogging is a really good idea to start putting your ideas out there. <coughs> um, when I started Kansas City Women in Technology, um, it, was, it was pretty selfish. I, j I just wanted to meet more chick devs, right? Um, I was one of 60 at my workplace. There weren't any women like me. I just wanted to meet more. Um, but there's this really unintended side effect that happened that, that turned out to be really cool. Somehow, by starting this, this big organization and um, having a couple marketing people do a really good job with it, um, I kind of became this lightning rod for anything related to, to women or girls in technology in Kansas City. I unintentionally placed myself as a thought leader and really started the ball rolling with a great community movement. Um, we started you know, cross-collaborating between different organizations. And so these next couple, I just want you to always think about that in the back of your mind. Even if you don't think you have something important to say, there's something you are uniquely and innately good at that will benefit everyone in this room and everyone outside. So I always think about that. And blogging, super safe way. And uh, if you do it on a certain website, you can just delete the asshole comments. So you don't even have to worry about that. <laughs> Speak. Um, this is the most terrifying thing I've ever done in my life. So, uh, but it was a really big goal of mine um, because we always hear about there not being enough women speakers at conferences. Um, well, it's kind of a, a chicken and the egg problem because women aren't going to want to try and speak if they don't see a lot of women out there. So some women have to start speaking to encourage those other women to start speaking. Da 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 da. -da. Hence, here we are. But this is a really good way to again build community, establish yourself as a thought leader, and start to make connections for people. Um, because you'll, you'll get this, this sweet badge of people are like, oh, they know what they're talking about, so I should you know, go and meet them. And you can say, oh, well, actually, I don't know about this, but so-and-so I met over here because we ran into e at each other at something knows that. And so you make another connection, like we did with the networking earlier. So speaking is really important to building a community, to establishing thought leadership, and, and to just bringing up the group as a whole just by adding your voice. Um, another shameless plug here. Uh, granted, not as shameless because we're not in Kansas City, but mentor. Uh, so I talked a little bit about Coder Dojo. Um, this is a program I'm really passionate about because um, our slogan is teaching kids how to code, but we're really teaching themselves, teaching them to teach themselves to code. Um, so mentoring has been such a cool activity. Um, I basically bully everybody I know into doing it, and it works really well. Um, we have mentors who are in all sorts of technology jobs all across Kansas City, and they come to this program um, where all these kids show up. And I have the mentors get on stage at the beginning, and I have them say their name and where they work and what they do. And all of a sudden, we've got these kids saying, OK, this really cool person has this really cool job. That's something that I can do. That's something that they're going to help me learn how to do. And so we kind of start that, that cycle turning, and we start to build a, a very young pipeline into the kind of developer community want, we want. Um, we definitely don't have a, enough college grads to support uh, the kind of needs that are, are being created in our industry. Um, so if we start mentoring early, if we start um, using our knowledge and, and our influence for these kids, we're going to create the kind of future developers we want to work with. Um, so that way you're not going to have like the young, fresh out of college punk like overriding everything in your source control because they don't know what they're doing. So you know you can use this as a way to build the kind of people that you want to work with, and it, it benefits everyone. Um, so mentoring, very key. Um, Cutter Dojo is so easy to start a chapter in your own community if there isn't one already. Um, they do everything for you. Or if you want to be really lazy, go to CoderDojoKC.com and like copy everything I do. Like I'll even give you the code for the website. Um, start your own chapter. Start mentoring. You're going to connect the developers in the area. You're going to connect the families. You're going to connect the kids, and you're going to grow the whole community of where you live. Um, so this one's like super hardcore. Plan an event. Um, this is about the pinnacle of community building that you can do because you're planning a large scale event that will unite all these lovely people. Um, this is Hack the Midwest, which is our local hackathon. So plan a hackathon, plan a conference, plan a boot camp, uh, plan a civic hack. Uh, we had that great talk earlier talking about Code for America. 
Um, all these are, are really great things that will build that sense of community. I'm not gonna tell you how to do this because I feel miserably at it, and so that's why I do a lot of the other things instead. But I really wanna recognize the people who do this well and encourage you to try and do something like this in your own community. Um, <clears throat> The cool thing about these two is they can be rallying points for people. Um, again, we talked about connecting, um, and, and this is just a more organic way to meet people that you wouldn't normally come into contact with, to build ideas, to generate things, um, to just get that kind of innovation that you might miss out on otherwise. Um, so before I move on to the last section, does anybody have any questions about content so far? OK. Um, so this is kind of like the downer part of the presentation. Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> you're, you're lucky I didn't like litter this whole thing with reaction gifts, because that's my, my bread and butter. But we're going to talk about things that destroy a community. Um, we've talked about how to build them, how to get people in, inviting the new guy um, to lunch, um, to kind of build these kind of inclusive, groups that people want to be a part of that they feel accepted in because let's face it we all probably grew up as nerds and weren't, weren't the, one of the cool kids um, but there are things that can tear down all your hard work and sometimes they can be of your own doing <clears throat> so the first thing I want to talk about is the, what I call the gray area because this is probably the thing that I struggle with the most um, we want to create communities that feel inclusive not exclusive um, but we also want to make sure that we maintain the integrity of the group um, and that uh, the people who are there need to be there. Um, I mean, there's always that guy, um, the one who derails conversation, the one who is hard to get along with, the one who drives people out of the room. There's always that lady who, um, you know, makes those comments that, you know, just don't, don't help the group, don't move things forward. And so how do, you, how do you create a community, how do you create a group, and how do you maintain it and remain inclusive but not um, have the people there who might drive your, your community members away? Um, where, where do you draw the line? Um, these people can just be like bad apples, like cancer cells slowly killing off all the good people in your group, and, and so it can be a really hard territory to navigate. Um, this is where I've settled. <laughs> um, so if you're a Star Trek fan, you are probably very familiar with the scene. Um, but yeah, th the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Um, so the way I've kind of um, looked at, at creating a community and how to deal with the bad apples is, is what's going to benefit the most people, what's going to be the best for the community, for the growth. Um, and sometimes that does mean having to find ways to skirt around the, the bad people. And it's an awful subject to talk about, and we don't want to exclude anyone. But at the same time, we need to make sure that the people that are there are positive and that are bringing the group up in a, in a good way and aren't going to bring us down. <clears throat> So this is the next one. Engineers are smart. It's why we're good at our jobs. Um, there's a certain level of ego that, that comes with that. Uh, and sometimes you have to really check yourself. Um, brilliant assholes don't help anyone. Uh, they can be really good at their job. They can be fantastic developers. Um, but when they bring people down, they're bringing the entire group down. Um, we've probably all been in a code review before. And there's somebody, and, and they've written an atrocious piece of code, and, and you're sitting there, and you're making your snide little comments and feeling smug and, and vastly superior. But how is that helping? Um, how is that helping instead of taking a coaching or mentoring approach to that person and saying, hey, this was a good effort. You know, um, why, don't, why don't you try doing it this way? Or you know what? I used to struggle with that, and I found this is a much better way to implement that. Um, I mean, you can probably go to a whole session on, on how to do code reviews and you are not your code and, and how to approach them appropriately, but being a brilliant asshole doesn't get us anywhere. And it's something that I've had to check myself on multiple times because as soon as you're on the other side of the spectrum, the world changes. When you've got brilliant assholes talking down to you, it destroys your self-esteem. You um, no longer feel like you have the ability to make these great world-changing things happen because that's been shattered. So don't be a brilliant asshole. Um, I do want to talk about the other side of the spectrum, though. 
because um, there is also the person who um, is going to take away your time as a developer. And they're going to ask you, well, how do I do this? And you're going to say, OK, well, well, did you Google it? Did you look on Stack Overflow? And they're going to be like, no. Well, why don't you try that? And then they're going to say, OK, will this work? I, I, I don't know. Did you try it? So um, you know, we've, we've got these two very, very far ends of the spectrum. We've got the brilliant asshole, and we've just got you know, average Joe over here who's, who's also not willing to put an effort to discover and learn things on his own. So like, how, do you, how do you navigate this territory? Um, so this is a cycle of competence. Um, this is actually something I learned about when I started dancing. Um, I dance uh, something called West Coast Swing. And it's a very interesting, very complex dance. And it actually appeals to a lot of developers, which is funny. Um, but uh, I learned about this thing called the cycle of competence. Because as soon as I, I learned the, the basic steps for this dance, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm awesome. I got this, da 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 da. And then um, I was at that stage of, um, where do we go? Unconscious incompetence. I didn't know what I didn't know. Because I didn't realize that while, yes, I knew the steps, I was the worst partner in the world to dance with because I couldn't follow. So I had no idea. And so I graduate to the step of conscious incompetence, where I'm at that point where I'm like, oh, crap. I know exactly what I don't know. And it's bad. And I know what I need to work on. And oh, my god. And so you move to that point. Um, and then hopefully, if you keep practicing hard enough, you're going to move to the point of conscious competence, where you do know what you know. You're, you're very aware of that. And then when you reach proficiency level, you get to unconscious competence, meaning you don't know what you do know. Um, something that might be complex or hard for other people is very basic for you, so basic that you might be a brilliant asshole about it, because you don't remember how hard it was to learn it. So this has been really important for me in, in navigating dealing with, with people in communities to figure out where they are in this cycle. And then the next important thing to figure out is, OK, if they're um, unconsciously incompetent and you try and get them to the next level, do they want to learn more? Or are they just always going to be lazy? And if they're just going to be lazy, then I'm like, OK, I don't have to worry about you know, the effort there. Um, but if they're consciously competent and, and helping other people and learning, that's, that's a really good place to be. And then with the unconscious competence, figure out, are they just so smart that they don't realize that this is hard for other people who are, who are just coming up in this skill set? Um, I was in this training group. We're at a JavaScript conference, but I'm in the process of learning um, Python on top of Django REST framework um, on top of some other hardcore stuff. And so we're talking learning a new language with new syntax, um, learning a very different way of thinking. And so we were working through um, a problem as a group and really struggling because the, the, the problem was written by somebody who was unconsciously competent. They wrote that question like somebody who's been writing Python for 10 years would understand it versus um, you know, when you're first learning something, sometimes you have to even figure out the right keywords to Google. And so we're struggling through. And, and the person leading the group asks, um, well, what are you struggling with? And so somebody says, well, not really understanding what the, what the question is asking, not really sure what this word is. And the person leading goes, well, I guess you have to spend a little more time reading about Python then, huh? Very deconstructive, because then nobody else in the group is ever going to say anything that they struggle with again, because they're going to be publicly shamed. Um, if you were uh, sitting in, in uh, Jen's talk earlier that was absolutely fantastic, she talked about that a little bit. It just it doesn't do anyone any good. Um, so in, in navigating that area between the brilliant asshole and, and the lazy, doesn't know anything person, um, keep this in the back of your mind, trying to figure out who you're dealing with and, and how the best way you can interact with them is that will, will help build the community. Um, this one is more workplace related. Um, avoid or beware of the FNG mentality. So um, I'm a big Band of Brothers fan. Uh, World War II, we um, trained troops like we never had before. Um, very revolutionary as far as uh, military training went. And these guys went through hell together. Um, and then we, we sent them overseas, and they just got blown to shit together. But they, they had this camaraderie. They had this bond. But you know the war went on, and, and we needed more troops. So then in come the FNGs. And the old soldiers that needed help were not very receptive to the FNGs because they didn't know what they were, gonna, they were doing. They were going to get everybody blown to hell. They didn't know how to operate their rifle. Um, and so they weren't very receptive. 
And so this happens a lot of times when, when you're at work and um, you have this code and you're really proud of it and it's your baby and it's perfect and you don't want anybody to mess it up. And so anybody that comes in is an FNG. And so when you respond to them in that way, it's not going to help. The only thing they're going to do is get themselves blown to hell. Fortunately, we're developers. We're not fighting a war. So beware of FNG mentality. You know, the new guy might make a couple mistakes, but be aware of that because if you help them and, and, and bring them into the community instead of being us versus them, you're going to strengthen your community. Um, and apathy. Uh, this is uh, really, really scary. Um, we want to be better. We want to. We want to move mountains. We want to make the world a better place thanks to this amazing skill set that we have. But there are going to be apathetic people who also have this skill set that we have. And when you have somebody in the group saying, "I don't care. It doesn't matter. We can't do anything. This sucks. This is bad." That can be very, very dangerous to your community. If you're that person and find yourself saying these things, you can be very dangerous to your community. So um, a lot of these things are things you might have to look at internally as well to make sure that you're not doing to build and, and grow your community. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going to wrap things up. Um, these slides are available on GitHub. And um, I always include this uh, for all my ladies in the room. There's a, a, a programmer, Ryan Gosling, Tumblr, just so you know, and it is absolutely fantastic. Um, so yes, for, for, my, for my lady community, I offer you this gift. Um, and that's all I got. If you have questions, hit me up. Yes? Somebody that sits in the unconscious confidence arena that tries really hard not to be an asshole, sometimes when I'm trying to mention people, like I just can't make the logical steps that they're, they're making because I've made those connections long ago, but I don't think about it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice on how I can better prepare for that before I'm actually talking to somebody? Because it usually, I'll give you an example. Somebody was asking me a very simple question about variable scope. Mm -hmm. It was something to the tune of if I name my variable this inside of a function, it would be something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's Can you tell me why you're asking that question? So, like, I'm trying to get yep. to the bottom of why they're thinking that. And it just didn't click to me that they didn't understand very mm -hmm. Um, so my advice to that would be find somebody who can explain it better, um, whether that's a blog post, um, whether that's something. I, I wanted to find a way to work this story into the presentation. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, so it, um, my job at the marketing agency, uh, we had this little group that we called Backbone and Beer. Right? Um, so I had been on a Backbone project before. Um, I was also learning JavaScript at the same time because I clearly make great life choices, and that was a good idea. Um, but so I still was at that very rudimentary level of, of understanding things very basically. And so I had a couple, a couple developer friends, and unfortunately we knew each other because of afternoon tea on a different team. And their team lead was very proficient in Backbone. He was, he was in that corner. And so when he would explain concepts to them, they're like, dude, I have no idea what you just said. So they came to me, and we would do Backbone and Beer sessions where I would kind of explain it at that level. So my advice to you would be, Find somebody or something or someone that can explain it better. Like go to Stack Overflow, and then if it makes sense to you, but it's explained at a better level, give them that. Any other questions? Yes. I'm curious about what what tools you might use to weed out like those bad apples that you talked about. Um, when I think about so the the one that I think can think of is like a conference or whatever, so code of conduct. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a really good approach in a, in a more um, formal setting. Uh, story about our KC Geek Night. Um, uh, we had um, this certain entrepreneur. We all know who he is because he pisses all of us off. <laughs> and he would always find his way into the group and would manage to like like radically annoy everyone just by saying like dick stuff. And so, um, like in that situation, we, um, I think we moved locations for a while and didn't advertise it at all. And so we went very speakeasy style with it. So like in a more informal setting, you know, we, we just kind of spread it word, by, word of mouth and then to kind of like, you know, make sure that the, the good people were retained. So um, it's, it's such a tricky thing and you'll probably have to find different solutions, but um, the speakeasy method is one that I would recommend um, for, <laughs> for smaller, more informal groups.
Other questions? Sweet. Thanks for coming.